increasing focus being paid to the value and the value add of black professors throughout higher education, but particularly at historically black colleges. Joining us today to talk about it, Dr. Sharon Davis uh, from Florida A&M University and associate professor of early education at the land grant flagship of Florida, who is one of the lead editors on a new strike again, a, a new <laughs> edition of work, the beauty and burden of being a black Professor, so Dr. Davis is really an honor to have you here this morning. Well, thank you, Mr. Carter. Very wonderful to be here with you, and thank you for having me. I really appreciate this platform, and appreciate you for all the work you do for HBCUs. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Um, let's get into the book. So this is a a work uh, involving a number of professors, notably all of a lot of you guys, HBCU graduates uh, in the HBCU professorate. What motivated you guys to to compile this work and what do you think the value is of telling the story of black faculty at large? Well, first of all, I want to um, I really want to thank Dr. Henry Frierson, who is the um, editor of this series, Diversity in Higher Education through Emerald Publishing. Dr. Frierson is the um, graduate He's a graduate dean at uh, University of Florida, and he really, really has opened a lot of doors for us. He's given us a grand opportunity just to, to be a voice and just to have a voice out here. This is um, our second edited book through his series, and um, we kind of and, and listen. He he's our our <laughs> kind of our academic uncle, if you will. He'll he'll get us straight in a minute. But um, shout out to my my wonderful editorial team, um, Dr. Adriel Hilton, who is the Dean of Students and Diversity Officer at Seton Hill University. Find him on Twitter, at Hilton Adriel. He's always tweeting, always out there. This brother is amazing. He's an amazing scholar. He's an amazing writer. He's an amazing friend. Don't try to take him from me because he's mine. I mean, he, he is awesome. Um, Ricardo Hamrick, he's at, um, he's a off, he's at the Office of Housing and Residence Life at um, Ohio University. And also our um, co-editor, Dr. F. Eric Brooks, he is a provost and VP at Central State, formerly at Kentucky State University. Um, so we, we've got a, we have a wonderful editorial team and I cannot tell you how um, hard we worked. Uh, you know, the, the idea came about just I mean, you know, we, hey, we, we know that there, there's a beauty and a burden to being black professors, but the, I told him that the follow up to this book would be um, the beauty and the burden of being black professors trying to put a book out during a pandemic and <laughs> <laughs> the, the burden of trying to get, that's a whole nother book in and of itself. If you knew what we went through, mm -hmm. but but it, it came to fruition and you know what? It was so worth it. It was so worth it. And, and I'm so thankful to these editors. I'm so thankful to these contributors because the contributors will fire, man. It's they are they are ridiculous. They are just ridiculous. Let's get into some of those anecdotes because uh, we know that the, the life of a, of a professor at an HBC, one who, particularly who is tenure track, um, is a unique experience and it, it truly is a labor of love. And there's so many stories to tell about uh tenure and promotion, about resources, about student engagement and student advisement, um, about, you know, research um, and, and, and scholarly promotion. What are some of the anecdotes that stood out, stuck out to you in this book that if they don't tell a core story of being a, a black faculty member, communicate, the, you know, the, the value of doing so in the face of such obstacles? Well, they, uh, you know, there's a saying, you know, if if you're not at the table, you're probably going to be what's for dinner, right? And 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 what has happened is so many times, especially for black professors, and not just in in HBCUs, just black professorship, um, in and of itself, it it offers an, a number of of challenges and a number of rewards right and so um the bravery the 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 bravery with which each of these um contributors have stepped forward and and I like to tell them they have opened up they've put their academic hearts 
on the pages of this book. It, it, it takes a lot to do that because, uh, believe it or not, there's a lot of politics involved in higher ed. Did you know that, Mr. Clark? <laughs> you wouldn't believe You wouldn't believe it. <laughs> I thought all you was teach. They told me when I came from elementary ed, all I would do was teach. Mm -hmm. and I get here and find out oh, there are three pillars to this thing, teaching, research, and service. And service, yeah. Another beast on the side that's called politics. <laughs> <laughs> it's, inter it's interesting because at, at the moment we're having this conversation, part of the, the, I guess, the national conversation around black faculty is revolving around Cornell West at Harvard, who has come out, you know, in recent days and said, you know, I was denied tenure or the opportunity for tenure and review because of, of, you know, what the school says is, is you know research and scholarly basis but he had a position that it, it could be based on some of his teachings and writings and and, and public commentary on things like is, israeli occupation um and other really touch tones of, of racial or social contention is that something that is faced by black faculty across the spectrum and what is that the, uh, the politics that you mentioned uh, they, they i would imagine they're not quite the same at hbcus but how do they look at HBCUs as, a, as opposed to a Cornell West or somebody at a PWI? It's very different. I, I mean, I, I recognize that. I mean, I, I'm a product of a PWI. I, I didn't attend an HBCU. I married a Rattler. Don't try, don't try to take him. He's good. He's a Rattler. But I didn't, <laughs> I didn't attend an HBCU. And, and so um, having come come into the HBCU spectrum, I recognized very quickly that I had a lot to learn. And, and so it's very funny. I always tell people the first book I ever edited was about what? HBCUs. Because I recognized very quickly the importance of them, the, the um, how important they are to, to, to who we are as a country and who we are as a people. I mean, that very quickly helped me to understand being positioned where they are, but the politics are very different. And I, and I see that as a professor, as, as a faculty member inside there. And so seeing what has happened to Dr. West and, and knowing that, you know, even the stakes there, the politics, you know, I'm, I, I recognize the freedoms that I have in an HBCU. I recognize how the conversations are different I recognize um, I'm very I'm acutely aware of of how those conversations are are very different there, but I'm also acutely aware culturally of of where I am. Um, I, I know myself, and I also know I know my culture, and, and so um, in, in knowing that you 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 recognize that there are um, there are burdens to that 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 we we oftentimes may not necessarily be very vocal about, if you will, but it presents its own set of, of challenges. There are thorns there. And, um, and, and in the words of Aubrey Drake, they don't have no rewards for that. That's not, <laughs> some, of these, some of these rewards are not, you know, uh, they're, they're not the high stakes rewards that we, we signed up for. Um, some of them are heart rewards, we like to call them in teaching. They're, 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 they're not high stakes. They're not the hard rewards. They're the heart rewards, and they don't pay a lot, if you will. But we get them. You know, they come in other forms. And so I think that's what's happened with this book, um, particularly with the contributors. We, we, we have these chapters where, you know, they talk about the fact that we have these bad boards, right? These these boards that that are built around um stakeholders who are are gatekeepers hmm? the these folks who have been in the game so long and and aren't okay with you know free thinkers or thinkers outside of the box coming along and making decisions we've got contributors like dr navel tani from from famu who has written a chapter with all of his graduate students who does that? Who lets graduate students come on to a book chapter and write with them, right? right? Unheard of. We've got contributors like um, Dr. LaVon Esther, who's a full professor at Purdue University. He wrote the epilogue for our book, you know, stressing how important, how important mentoring is. Shout out to Dr. LaVon 
Esther's. I call him Dr. Lester's. He's going to get mad at me. <laughs> Lester's with his MAP program, MAPP at Purdue University, you know, talking about how important mentoring is. He, he really has a heart for that, you know, and these things we don't necessarily, they don't get written down on check, right? We do that because we know the importance of keeping this pipeline open. And, and this is one of the things that Dr. Hilton and I talked about many, many years ago when we, um, when we met, when we won the, the AABHE, the American Association for Blacks in Higher Education um, Dissertation Awards back in maybe 2009, we were both the awardees. And, and on that very same weekend, Dr. Hilton was the top 30 under 30 in Ebony Magazine. And, and we were in the grocery store cashing our, I shouldn't tell this story, should I? <laughs> you should tell the story. I'm probably, probably <laughs> We're in the, we were in the grocery store in Atlanta cashing our checks before the conference was even over. They gave us <laughs> they gave us these like $500 checks for winning the dissertation awards, right? And we're out cashing because we were going out that night. We were so happy. We were, <laughs> we, we were gonna go spend our checks. We were going out to eat. And he was like, oh, I'm in the magazine. And I'm like, what are you in the magazine for, dude? And I opened it up and he's in there for top 30 under 30. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is really you. I'm looking at the magazine. I'm looking at him. We are in the grocery store, right? And he is in the back. I'm like, who, wait a who are you? I'm going to ride with you, dude. That was, that was in 2009. Mm -hmm. right? And we, we are literally, I won't tell you where we went. Okay. I'm going to tell you where we went sometime, someplace downtown. <laughs> <laughs> Everything we're going to do and how we're going to open doors for, for other black students, you know, mm -hmm. when we become professors, when we, when we get in the game and now to see our dreams come to fruition and to see these wonderful contributors, you know, recognizing that Dr. Henry Frierson has opened doors for us and, and we want to do the same thing, you know, it, seeing us build to that place, it gives me so much gratitude and so much um honor to be able to do that and I, i'm very very grateful especially to publishing companies like emerald even this month black history month that they would put on a pedestal you know celebrating black history and offering the first chapter of this book for free so if you are listening right now to to this podcast if you are watching right now please go to emerald publishing and download the first chapter of our book, The Beauty and the Burden of Being a Black Professor, for free all this month. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you're listening, you can also, all of your listeners, you can purchase the book either on Amazon or you can go to Emerald Publishing and, pub and um, get the book for 30% off using the code Emerald30. We'll be sure to have that listed below. So folks can definitely take advantage of that. Let, let's talk real quick about the, uh, the the dichotomy between the the pedagogy and the politics of being a black professor. There's so much that you want to embed in a curriculum, so much you want to embed in your mentoring of folks who are coming up under you at any level, baccalaureate or graduate. And then there's the politics of what you can teach, um, what the expectation is in the academy for a department, uh, for a school or a college, and then for the university at large. Are there ways that those things work together? Are there ways, are there profound ways that they are in conflict? There are profound ways that they are in conflict. Um, and we always talk about academic freedom in, in, in higher education and, um, you know, we 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 want to be free. <laughs> mm -hmm. Everybody wants to be free, um, but I don't know many institutions. I, and and I was thinking about this this morning. I don't know many institutions. Do you know of any whose president also has the name of the institution on the front of them? <laughs> so all these people that are revered as you know the the, the presidents, the provosts. I don't know any institutions for which if the president were to, God forbid, pass away tomorrow, that institution is going to be erected. And that person's name is on the front of it, right? Mm -hmm. So we are essentially all of us are working for institutions, even the presidents, even the provosts. We are continuing on something that will live perpetually beyond our names. Mm -hmm. And so we are a something 
else beyond our names. And so to me, that means that what we go in with and what we do is dependent upon what we believe in and what we believe carries. And so we're always taking a chance. We're always fighting against, you know, these, these um, institutional guards. We're always fighting against, you know, what we believe in, no matter where we are, no matter where you stand, even in HBCUs, even in MSIs. And so, you know, I, I think particularly with the contributors to, to you know, this text and, and, and you know, and, and shout out to all the teachers. Honestly, I'm a teacher's teacher. I'm a former second grade teacher. We're, we're always pushing against the grain to make sure that students are receiving the best of us mm -hmm. right and that doesn't always fit into everyone's political or 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 social construct and um it's it's a difficult decision every day and so i applaud everyone who does that and, and, and so if you get a if you have an opportunity check out particularly you know when you're looking through and looking at the chapters um and, and looking at this book and deciding what you want to read in it, take a good look at the chapters because these these authors have have really given their stories. There's even a story. There's even a, a, a narrative in here from um, Dr. Carlos Minor, and he pretty much gives you an, an essay and tells you what not to do. Mm -hmm. He tells you. He literally gives you. And and I appreciate this so much. Shout out to to Carlos Minor because he is, I, I do this in my classes as well. I always tell them, I only made two mistakes in life in my whole career and I'm gonna tell you about them <laughs> so you don't make them. Well, he mm. tells you the one mistake he made, he got him kicked out of higher ed. Mm. And how bold is that to do that for everyone else so that you don't make the same mistake? And he essentially tells you, this is how I got blackballed. And how many of us have gotten blackballed? Forget about career. How many of us got blackballed out of Divine Nine, right? Mm. I mean, hmm, hmm. How many of us like, but hmm, out of those organizations, how many of us get? And you look back and you're like, well, what? Wait a minute. I didn't even mean to. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Mm -hmm. If somebody had told me that if I had talked to so and so, or if somebody told me if I had gone to that party, you don't even know you're doing it while you're doing it. And so I, I just think it's so bold what these, what these authors, what these contributors have done. And so, I really think this is one of those books that, you know, you bring into your classroom, you bring into your higher education classroom, you're going to find that your students are going to appreciate this on a level that you you haven't seen before. You you want them to read a text and then I'm not reading tonight. I got enough homework and enough to do. This is the one that they're going to pick up and be like, I can relate to that. I can relate to that. What's, and then the last question, and again, we're so appreciative of your time. What's What's the one um point of optimism that you would give folks who want to be in the academy and particularly those who want to be on a leadership or an executive track um because i don't think you do all this work and the end game is to, to finish where you started so what is the one thing that you tell people aside from the joy of teaching and endowing you know students with with information and preparation for a career and for life what's the one thing you tell them you know what stick with it because it's worthwhile if you do these things I think moments like this, mm -hmm. uh, moments like this, uh, being able to chat with you, um, the the opportunities uh, like this, um, knowing that there's a there's a light at the end of the tunnel, knowing that you can um, that people have have made opportunities for all of those times when you feel like you've gotten shot down. Um, th there are there are those little bursts of light when you know you've done something good for others. Um, it's that that email that you get late in the evening that you know you've made a difference in, in someone's life. Um, it's that little tweet that reminds you that, you know, you're okay. You're doing, you're doing a swell job. Um, it, it's that mentorship. It's that little, it's that little seed that you plant for every person. It's the, the tenure and promotion approval that every single one of, and I'm saying it right now because I know it's going to happen, every single one of these <laughs> contributors to this book and even the graduate students who are working their butts off, who've gotten this opportunity, 
to to have their name in the pages of a book like i couldn't dream of that as a graduate student i didn't even have a publication mm -hmm. nobody told me this was possible it's that type of thing that makes it all worthwhile to me and it, it makes everything else that seems so hard and so hurtful even in these times that we're in it doesn't even matter because this is what it's all about follow me on twitter at dr sharon davis at d-r-c-h-e-r-o-n-d-a-v-i-s yay